already you have known about the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system i just want to give you a outlook or recapitulation about the nervous system in general so autonomic somatic autonomic can be divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic or cholinergic system so already do you, i think you have a clear concept about the difference between the autonomic and somatic if you do not have clear concept just recapitulate this so basically the efferent nerves of the autonomic nervous system supply all innervated structures of the body. Innervated means where the nerve is present, different types of the organs, the nerve is present. Here the efferent nerves of the ANS supply, except skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the exception which is supplied by the somatic nerves. Just remember this. The most distal synaptic junctions in the autonomic reflex arc occurs in ganglia. Already in the physiology, you have read about the ganglion. There is presynaptic neurons, prosynaptic neurons, and within the synaptic cleft, there is neurotransmitter. Okay. Somatic nerves basically contain no peripheral ganglia, and the synapses are located entirely within the cerebrospinal axis. So this is separate about the somatic nerves. 
Now most autonomic nerves form extensive peripheral plexuses. Plexus means they are a different intercalated uh, network of the nerves. And such networks are absent from the somatic system. So somatic system there is no ganglia, there is no intercalated network of the nerves. Postganglionic autonomic nerves. So postganglionic, so after ganglion. So there is ganglion, before ganglion there is preganglionic neuron, after ganglion there is postganglionic neurons. So postganglionic autonomic nerves generally are non-myelinated. In the physiology, you have already read about the myelinated and non-myelinated nerves. So these are the non-myelinated nerves and motor nerves to skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle, the movement of the skeletal muscle occurs due to the motor nerves and this is the myelinated. When the spinal efferent nerves are interrupted, smooth muscles and glands generally retain some level of spontaneous activity, whereas the denervated skeletal muscles are paralyzed because there is autonomic nervous system innervation. So in the smooth muscles of our body, so you know from the physiology, there are different organs where the smooth muscle is present. Smooth muscle is innervated by the autonomic nervous system. Skeletal muscle is innervated by the somatic nervous system. Hence, when there is some, for example, trauma, when there is some uh, problems in the nerve conduction, in the somatic nerves, there will be total paralysis. That is the skeletal muscle cannot move. But in the smooth muscles, there will not be total paralysis because it is, uh, it is under the control of the autonomic nervous system. So basically sympathetic is the thoracolumbar and the parasympathetic is the craniosacral divisions, you already know. Both divisions originate in nuclei within the central nervous system and give rise to preganglionic efferent fibers. So there is efferent nerves, ganglion and after that there is efferent nerves that exit from the brainstem of spinal cord and terminate in motor ganglia. So sympathetic means thoracolumbar, parasympathetic means craniosacral, just remember this. The sympathetic preganglionic fibers leave the central nervous system through the thoracic and lumbar spinal nerves. That's why it is known as the thoracolumbar. So there is thoracic lumbar, thoracic nerves th uh, and lumbar spinal nerves and through this the sympathetic preganglionic fibers leave. That's why this is known as the thoracolumbar system. And the parasympathetic system is known as the craniosacral system because it leaves the central nervous system through the third, seventh, ninth and tenth cranial nerves and third and fourth sacral spinal nerves. That's why it is known as the craniosacral. So this is the difference between the thoracolumbar and craniosacral. Thoracolumbar is sympathetic, craniosacral is parasympathetic. So the division between the sympathetic and parasympathetic system is mainly anatomical from where the preganglionic neurons come out. Okay. So most of the sympathetic preganglionic fibers terminate in ganglia located in the paravertebral chains. So within the vertebra, in besides of the vertebra, there are paravertebral chains that lie on either side of the spinal column where it terminate, the sympathetic preganglionic fibers. The majority of the parasympathetic preganglionic fibers terminate on ganglion cells distributed diffusely or in networks in the walls of the innervated organ. Innervated organs means organs where the parasympathetic supply is present. For example, eye, for example, autonomic fibers, all postganglionic parasympathetic fibers and a few postganglionic sympathetic fiber in acetylcholine. Just remember, this is important. So all preganglionic autonomic fibers, whether it is sympathetic or parasympathetic, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, all postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, and a few postganglionic sympathetic fibers, the neurotransmitter is also acetylcholine. There are some postganglionic parasympathetic nerves that can use the nitric oxide and they can be referred as the nitragic. Basically, these are present in the blood vessels. So within the blood vessels, you know there are endothelial cells and endothelium. And within the endothelium, there are innervations of the parasympathetic system in some cases. And they basically release the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide basically dilates the blood vessels. So ultimately, it decreases the blood pressure. Adrenergic nerve fibers comprise the majority of the postganglionic sympathetic fibers. So sympathetic fibers, postganglionic, majority is the adrenergic fibers, where the neurotransmitter is the majority norepinephrine. In some sympathetic postganglionic fibers, the neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine. But in all, 
parasympathetic postganglionic fibers, the neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine. And substance free and glutamate is present uh, some other in, in some of the neurons, that is not important. So comparison, this is the same thing. Just remember this, what I have discussed. So basically, this will be clear if you see this picture. So this is the autonomic system, this is the somatic system. So within the autonomic system, you can see this is the preganglionic fibers and here it is the postganglionic fibers. So in the preganglionic fibers, whether it is sympathetic or whether it is parasympathetic, in all these cases you can see acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. So preganglionic sympathetic fibers, preganglionic parasympathetic fibers, in all these cases acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. In case of the sympathetic, you can see it acts on the nicotinic receptor or nicotinic receptor and after that postganglionic neurons comes. In case of the sympathetic fibers, the, the main neurotransmitter in the postganglionic neurons is the norepinephrine, whereas in the parasympathetic, the main is the acetylcholine. So in the parasympathetic system, there is both acetylcholine and acetylcholine. Both in the preganglionic and postganglionic areas, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. In case of the sympathetic, in the preganglionic acetylcholine, in the postganglionic norepinephrine, and there are some sympathetic fibers already have discussed. For example, sympathetic innervation of the adrenal medulla, where the innervation you can see the acetylcholine from the adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine is secreted into the blood, and ultimately it acts on the adrenergic receptors. And there are some other nerves also where the acetylcholine is also released. And within the somatic system, there is no ganglia, already I have discussed. Here also, the neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine. It acts on the nicotinic receptors. In the parasympathetic system, you can see, after in the postganglionic fibers, the acetylcholine acts mainly on the muscarinic receptors. He, in the somatic system, it acts on the nicotinic receptors. Here the norepinephrine acts on the adrenergic receptors. Here also it acts on the adrenergic receptors. So it is clear. So just remember acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter in all preganglionic autonomic neurons, whether it is sympathetic, whether it is parasympathetic, whether it is somatic. In the postganglionic neurons, in the parasympathetic, there is always acetylcholine. In the sympathetic, in most of the cases, this is norepinephrine, but in some cases, there is acetylcholine. In the somatic nerves, there is no ganglia. In fact, there is only, that's why there is only one neurotransmitter, that is the acetylcholine. This is the same thing, you can see. So, somatic system, various levels of the spinal cord, motor neurons come, the acetylcholine acts at the nicotinic receptor. This is the nicotinic receptor. This is the skeletal muscle. So, remember, bar bar, the skeletal muscle is mainly innervated by the somatic nerves, but the smooth muscles are innervated by the autonomic nerves. So, autonomic system, parasympathetic, sympathetic, the same thing. So, there is ganglia. This is the preganglionic fibers. This is the preganglionic fibers, acetylcholine is present, acetylcholine is present and in the postganglionic fibers there is acetylcholine which acts on the different organs where the innervation is present like smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, secretory glands etc. Here there is norepinephrine, in some cases there is acetylcholine and it, and it acts on the different other systems. So basically this is the anatomy and the physiology of this, this is the same thing. Now coming to the actions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves in a nut cell. So in the red ones you can see this is the sympathetic actions and in the blue one is the parasympathetic actions. So from this it will also be clear from you. For example eye, eye is very important organ where the, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation is present. So when there is sympathetic stimulation that causes contraction of the iris radial muscle. So pupil dilates. So dilatation of the pupil occurs when the sympathetic, symp some sympathetic drug is given or sympathetic activity is increased. When the parasympathetic drug is given or parasympathetic activity is increased, the opposite happens. The contraction of the iris sphincter muscle, so pupil basically contracts. Constriction of the pupil occurs. Contraction of the ciliary muscle occurs. So lens accommodates for near vision. This is for eye. For the bronchioles, dilatation is caused by the sympathetic innervation, constriction and increased secretion caused by the parasympathetic innervation. So when there is parasympathetic stimulation, there is more secretion from the bronchias. Okay. But there is less secretion occurs when there is sympathetic stimulation. In adrenal medulla, there is secretion of the epinephrine and non-epinephrine, no parasympathetic innervation. 
in the kidney the same thing secretion of the renin occurs due to sympathetic innervation ureter and bladder again due to the sympathetic actions relaxation of the detrusor and contraction of the bladder trigone occurs and sphincter and due to the parasympathetic action contraction of the detrusor occurs just opposite and relaxation of the trigone and sphincter occurs just opposite genitalia stimulation of ejaculation occurs by the sympathetic action and stimulation of erection occurs due to parasympathetic actions in the lacrimal glands stimulation of the tears it occurs due to the parasympathetic action there is no sympathetic innervation in the tear glands salivary glands copious watery secretion occurs when there is parasympathetic stimulation cholinergic stimulation whereas the thick viscous secretion occurs there when there is sympathetic stimulation in case of the heart just opposite cholinergic system always decrease the heart so when we are ex excites the cholinergic system the parasympathetic system the heart rate will be decreased when we are exciting the sympathetic system the heart rate will increase because the sympathetic system is the flight and fright you already know gastrointestinal system similar the sympathetic system causes decreased muscle motility and tone contraction of the sphincters and parasympathetic actions causes increased muscle motility and tone genitalia relaxation of the uterus dilatation and constriction all these are due to the sympathetic actions so from this nutshell you can get a clear idea about what the actions of the sympathetic system and parasympathetic system occurs so parasympathetic nervous system or craniosacral outflow basically innervates these organs in a nutshell so basically it innervates the heart within the heart the sa and av node within the eye the sphincter muscles of the iris and ciliary muscles already we have seen in the lacrimal gland already we have seen there is lacrimation when the parasympathetic stimulation is there submaxillary and sublingual glands so there is secretion from different salivary glands occurs when there is parasympathetic stimulation similar to parotid glands bronchial or bronchi stomach in all these cases when the parasympathetic stimulation occurs there will be more secretion more secretion okay small intestine bile duct gallbladder kidney large intestine bladder and genitalia so in a nutshell the sympathetic innervation is present in all these organs now coming to the acetylcholine so acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter already we have seen it is a physical substance it is the acetic acid ester of choline so basically this is a ester it is synthesized in the axonal terminal from the choline and acetyl coenzyme a i am just showing this picture first so choline is present in the plasma this choline choline is taken up within the neurons by means of the choline transporter proteins choline uptake occurs so choline comes you can see this is the symporter choline sodium symporter choline comes within the preganglionic neurons and up within the mitochondria it comes within the mitochondria there is acetyl coenzyme a acetyl coenzyme a combines with the choline to form the acetyl choline and this acetyl choline is mainly formed within the mitochondria in the preganglionic neurons now within the preganglionic neurons there are different types of the vesicles there are large vesicles and small vesicles this most of the small vesicles are present around the periphery of the neurons and there are some large vesicles also that also contain different types of the peptide transmitter so there are some other neurotransmitter like peptide neurotransmitter for example bip is present okay so there are small synaptic vesicles this acetylcholine comes within the small synaptic vesicles this is known as the uptake into the storage vesicles okay so this is the synthesis of the acetylcholine and this choline uptake this is the rate limiting step in the acetylcholine synthesis so if we can control this uptake of the choline within this mitochondria of the neurons then the acetylcholine synthesis can be modulated and this is this can be done by a chemical substance known as the hemicholinium i am coming to this so hemicholinium is basically blocks this choline uptake within the mitochondria in the preganglionic neurons and after this it comes to the vesicles and within the synaptic vesicles then it causes the attaches with the neurotrans that is the synaptic cleft and release of the neurotransmitter occurs release of the neurotransmitter occurs and ultimately the neurotransmitter acetylcholine comes and acts on the 
acetylcholine receptors there are two types of the receptors muscarinic and nicotinic i am coming to this acetylcholine can act on this muscarinic and nicotinic receptors so after the action acetylcholine is very much short lived within seconds it will be destroyed by means of the one chemical substance known as the acetylcholine esterase now there are two types of the acetylcholine esterase one is the acetylcholine esterase one is the pseudo acetylcholine esterase also known as the butyrylcholine esterase this acetylcholine esterase is quite specific basically they destroys the acetylcholine but butyrylcholine esterase is non specific and this acetylcholine esterase is present within this synaptic cleft within this neurons itself but this butyrylcholine esterase is present in different organs for example stomach and also in the plasma the main actions of the butyrylcholine esterase is now it has been proved that when we are uh, taking some other esters for example some skeletal muscle relaxants is given some organophosphorus poisoning or some other ester is given from outside that can be taken care of this butyrylcholine esterase or pseudocholine esterase but this acetylcholine is mainly destroyed by the acetylcholine esterase itself so degradation of the acetylcholine occur then choline comes out again choline comes to the plasma and again it taken up so this there will be a cycle so by this way the cycle continues so that the acetylcholine comes and then degraded and then again taken up so choline is transported from the extracellular fluid by a high affinity sodium dependent choline transport protein and this is the rate limiting step already i have discussed so choline uptake choline uptake is done by means of the choline sodium symporter so both the choline and the sodium ion comes within the neurons and this is the rate limiting step that is we can limit we can modulate how much acetylcholine can be formed by limiting this step acetylcholine storage occurs in the vesicles and release in the presence of the action potential at the nerve terminal causes influx of calcium ions so when there is action potential when there is excitation of the nerves there will be calcium ion influx within the synaptic vesicles and within the synaptic vesicles the acetylcholine comes out from the in the synaptic cleft so which triggers the release of the acetylcholine by exocytosis so this is you can see the same thing so cal calcium comes calcium enters within the synaptic vesicles and this acetylcholine comes within the synaptic cleft okay and there are some presynaptic receptors also so some part of the acetylcholine is destroyed and some part are again taken up by the presynaptic receptors and again it is recirculated the same thing you can see now what i am talking about this is the rate limiting step choline enters within this choline with the acetyl coenzyme a in the mitochondria by means of the choline acetyl transferase enzyme it is converted to the acetylcholine and this can be blocked by one uh, compound known as the hemicholinium so hemicholinium can block the rate limiting step of the acetylcholine synthesis what is the rate limiting step of the acetylcholine synthesis that is the choline uptake from the plasma within the neurons choline uptake occurs by means of the choline sodium ion symporter choline and sodium ion both comes within the neurons within the mitochondria of the neurons where there is presence of one enzyme known, known as the choline acetyl transferase this choline acetyl transferase co combines the acetyl coenzyme a already present within the mitochondria with the choline to forms the acetylcholine then this acetylcholine are packed within the synaptic vesicles then it comes and ultimately this is exocytosis occurs now this packing of the acetylcholine within the vesicles this can be blocked by another compound known as the vesamicol so vesamicol basically blocks the packing of this acetylcholine or the coming of the acetylcholine from the neuronal cytoplasm to the synaptic vesicle so vesamicol so there are two blockers one is hemicholinium and one is vesamicol this is very important okay so after that the exocytosis occurs this exocytosis again is blocked by the botulinum toxin so there is one toxin known as the botulinum this toxin can block this exocytosis okay so these three hemicholinium vesamicol and botulinum toxin 
very important so acetylcholine synthesis how it is synthesized what are the steps and what are the blockers this is very important so the same thing hemicholinium blocks the choline uptake the rate limiting step in acetylcholine synthesis and depletes acetylcholine active transport of acetylcholine hey aste active transport of acetylcholine into synaptic vesicles is affected by carrier which is boxed by vesamical so first is hemicholinium next is vesamical next is botulinum toxin two toxins basically there is another toxin another is the black widow spider toxin botulinum toxin we have seen that they basically inhibits the release and black widow spider toxin induces massive release and ultimately depletion when there is massive release of the acetylcholine occurs there will be shortage of the choline there will be shortage of the acetylcholine supply in the synaptic cleft so this is the other way by which the black widow spider toxin acts so basically they causes massive release of the acetylcholine and ultimately depletion of the acetylcholine whereas the botulinum toxin blocks the exocytosis of the synaptic vesicle within the neural within the neuroleptic cleft and by this they can block the cholinergic transmission so remember hemicholinium vesamical botulinum toxin and black widow spider toxin so already we have discussed the acetylcholine esterase and pseudocholine esterase so when it comes out this is basically metabolized by the acetylcholine esterase and butyrylcholine esterase or pseudocholine esterase now coming to the receptors another very important so after this acetylcholine acts on two types of the receptors muscarinic and nicotinic what are why are these names so basically it has been seen is muscarin is basically an alkaloid and it has been seen that these receptors can be excited by the muscarin that's why this is known as the muscarinic receptors and there are some other types of the receptors which are basically excited by the nicotine that's why this is known as the nicotinic receptors now there are difference muscarinic receptors are basically g protein coupled receptor and nicotinic receptors are ligand gated ion channels very important so muscarinic receptors nicotinic receptors muscarinic receptors are the g protein coupled receptors and nicotinic receptors are the ligand gated ion channels okay now coming to the types of the receptors so firstly remember there are mainly five types of the muscarinic receptors m1 to m5 of this m1 m2 and m3 these three are the major subtypes so most of the actions of the acetylcholine on the muscarinic receptors are basically mediated by the m1 receptor m2 receptor and m3 receptor okay m4 and m5 are not so so important so this is about the muscarinic receptors so m1 receptor m1 receptor is also known as the just remember it is a neuronal receptor m1 is neuronal so basically it is present in the different types of the cns and neurons m2 is the cardiac receptor so m2 receptors is mainly present in the heart and m3 receptor is glandular receptor that is it is present in different types of the exocrine glands this is easier to remember okay so it is present in different areas but remember muscarinic receptors there are five receptors m1 to m3 are the major three subtypes m1 is the neuronal type receptor m2 is the cardiac type receptor and m3 is the glandular type receptor now you can see m1 receptor is present in the autonomic ganglia cns and gastric glands okay so may, these are the areas where it is present oxtremorin is the agonist of the m1 receptor and pyrenzepine telangipine is the antagonist of the m1 receptor so these are the specific agonist and antagonist of the m1 receptor for example pyrenzepine is used in case of the different types to decrease the gastric secretion so when there is some peptic ulcer or when there is some acid peptic disorder when there we have to decrease the secretion of the gastric glands so we have to block the m1 receptor m1 receptor is already present in the gastric glands so we want to block this m1 receptor so m1 antagonist is pyrenzepine you can see so it can be used okay so m1 similarly m2 receptor is already i have seen m2 receptor is mainly present in the heart so in the heart it is present in the sa node ab node atrium ventricle apart from this there are some presence in the cns and visceral smooth muscles also in the heart they mainly decrease the rate of impulse conduction and generation that is they decrease the heart rate remember this is the main thing cholinergic nerves m2 receptor 
So how the see, parasympathetic system decrease the heart rate by acting on the M2 receptors? Okay. How the parasympathetic system increase the gastric gland secretion by acting on the M1 receptor? So you can see, so these are the agonist and antagonist, methacholine and metriclomamine, tryptamine. This is uh, not so important, not now it is used. So this is the M2. Now coming to the M3, M3 is the glandular. So M3 is mainly present different types of the exocrine glands in our body and also visceral smooth muscles. So when it is excited, so there will be visceral smooth muscle contraction in the eye. The M3 receptor is present. When it is uh, 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 excited, there will be constriction of the pupil. In the ciliary muscle, there will be contraction. Different types of the exocrine glands, they cause a secretion. So secretion, there may be lacrimal gland, there may be parotid gland, there may be submandibular gland, different other types of the glands. In all these cases, the empty receptor is present, empty receptor is activated by the cholinergic system and ultimately they cause this increased secretion. And in the vascular endothelium, already I have also told about this, in the vascular endothelium, in the blood vessels, there are cholinergic innervations, there are less cholinergic innervations but empty receptor is present. Now when it is excited, basically there is release of the nitric oxide. This is also known as the EDRF, that is the endothelium derived relaxing factor. So how in the blood vessels the cholinergic system acts? That is in the blood vessels there is endothelium. Within the endothelium M3 receptor is present. M3 receptor is activated and ultimately it leads to vasodilation by release of the nitric oxide or endothelium derived relaxing factor EDRF. So these are the agents agonist you can see M3 agonist is the bethanical it is used and M3 antagonist is solifenacin and darifenacin. All these are clinically used. So bethanical, solifenacin, darifenacin, pyrenzepine, these drugs are clinically used. Okay. So this is about the M1, M2, M3. So it is clear about the M1, M2, M3. M1 is neuronal, M2 is the cardiac, M3 is the glandular. Where it is present, what it acts and what are the agonist and antagonist. Apart from this there is M4 and M5, these are the minor subtypes. M4 is mainly present in the CNS, uh, the actions are more or less similar to the M1. You can see the atropine is basically the antagonist, uh, ipratopium, MTT, tolteridine, oxybutynine, etc. can act as an antagonist. This is not important but important is M1 to M3. M5 is again it is present in the CNS, uh, again its action is similar to the M1 but there is some uh, typical actions of the M5. It causes augmentation of the drug seeking behavior and reward phenomenon. In the CNS chapter you will read about the opioids. So opioids are the uh, habit forming drugs. So basically that causes some drug abuse that can be explained by the M5 receptor subtype. And these are the, uh, the agonist is the same as M1 and the antagonist is the tolteridine, atropine etc. So this is the important M1, M2, M3. These are the muscarinic receptor, muscarinic because these receptors when it is invented it has been seen that they can be excited by one chemical compound known as the muscarine. Okay. Next coming to the nicotinic receptor that is these are basically excited by the nicotine. So nicotinic receptors there are two types of the nicotinic receptors NM and NN. NM, NN. Okay. So NM receptor is present in the neuromuscular junction in short and NN receptor is present in the autonomic ganglia. So in short you have to remember NM that is the neuromuscular. NM present in the neuromuscular junction and NN receptor is present in the autonomic ganglia. All types of the autonomic ganglia. So in the neuromuscular junction it causes depolarization of the muscle end plate to contraction of the skeletal muscle can occur. So already we have seen that in the somatic nervous system the neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine and this acetylcholine acts on the NN receptor and ultimately it can cause the contraction of the skeletal muscle. In the NN receptor or autonomic ganglia causes depolarization, in the adrenal medulla there causes catecholamine release and in the CNS there may be some excitation and inhibition. That is it depends upon what are the organs that is what parts of the CNS is excited. So neuromuscular junction autonomic ganglia. These are all the ligand gated ion channels. 
these are more or less similar agonist is ptm and nicotine and this is dmpp and nicotine these are the chemical compounds not used clinically antagonist is the tubocuranin and alpha bangarotoxin and nn receptor antagonist is the hexametanium and trimetaphan so hexametanium trimetaphan is used in some of the cases so this is the nicotinic receptors muscarinic and nicotinic so this is about the adrenergic and cholinergic responses you will get the uh, uh, ppt so you will read this because it is for the clearance of your cons for example in the heart sa node sa node you know that is the pacemaker of the heart and it is innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic system and sympathetic system basically accelerates the sa node by acting on the beta 1 receptor you have already read about the beta receptors and deceleration occurs that is the decrease of the heart rate occurs by means of the muscarinic receptor the which muscarinic receptor m2 m2 receptor is present in sa node for example like this the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation is present and which is more excited depends what is the actions and ultimately outcome of that organ similarly gastrointestinal tract already we have seen that this ultimately contracts the sympathetic system and it relaxes the parasympathetic system the same thing in the skin metabolic functions etc now coming to the cholinergic drugs or parasympathetic drugs now we can broadly divide this as the directly acting and indirectly acting so directly acting drugs are basically main the parasympathetic mimetic drugs and the indirectly acting drugs are known as the anticholinesterases okay anticholinesterases will be discussed in the next class so directly acting cholinergic drugs the main drugs is the acetylcholine which is the prototype drug there are some synthetic choline esters like methacholine carbacol and bethanicol of this the bethanicol is clinically used methacholine is mainly used in some diagnostic purposes and there are some natural alkaloids like aricoline nicotine muscarine and pilocarpine again pilocarpine is clinically used okay ha ha drop us see anticholine esters the names are it can be divided into reversible and irreversible that is where are the actions of this destruction that is the inhibition of the acetylcholine esterase enzyme can be reverted or not reverted so reversible may be natural alkaloids like physostigmine there may be some quaternary compounds like hydrophonium neostigmine pyridostigmine aminonium dimecarium rivastigmine so these are the different drugs used in different cases reversible mainly the organophosphorus and mainly these are used different types of the insecticides or pesticides and we can see the poisoning of these types of the irreversible anticholinesterases in our words so organophosphorus poisoning quite common in this birbhum or bardhaman district you can see in the words that many of the patients come with the insecticide poisoning mostly of these are the organophosphorus poisoning it will be discussed in the next class so the examples are the ecothiophate isofluoropate paraxion parathion malathion this malathion and parathion poisoning is very common this is used as in insecticides uh, carbamates is propoxor is present apart from this there are different types of the nerve gas also like sarin this is a nerve gas ha uh ha -huh. so these are the directly acting indirectly acting so what are the now question is the what are the pharmacological actions of the acetylcholine in human heart very important what are the actions acetylcholine human heart er upor ki action korche the primary cardiovascular effect of this muscarinic agonist are reduction in peripheral vascular resistance and changes in heart rate ebhabe bolta so there are two areas one is peripheral vascular resistance and that is heart rate because we already know that in the blood vessels also m3 receptor is present and in the heart there is m2 receptor is present so both can be activated now if we do the intravenous infusions of the minimally effective doses of the acetylcholine in humans that is approximately 20 to 50 microgram per minute it causes vasodilatation this vasodilatation occurs by activation of the m3 receptor present in the endothelium that on activation releases the nitric oxide or edrf and that causes the dilatation of the blood vessels resulting in a reduction in blood vessel when the blood blood uh, when the when there is vasodilatation the blood pressure will be decreased often accompanied by a reflex increased heart rate known as the tachycardia when there is vasodilatation the heart will try to compensate this so the heart rate will increase more than 100 so when the heart rate is less than 60 it is known as the bradycardia 
when the heart rate is more than 100 it is known as the tachycardia this is known as the compensatory sinus tachycardia this occurs due to the peripheral vasodilation by acting on the empty receptors now if we give a large dose of the acetylcholine that produces bradycardia because that ultimately acts more on the m2 receptors present in the heart already we have discussed so in the heart there is sa node av node etc in all these cases there is innervations of the cholinergic uh, nerves and ultimately all these decreases the impulse generation and ultimately the bradycardia occurs and decrease atrioventricular node conduction velocity in addition to hypotension when there is bradycardia there will be hypotension so the direct cardiac actions of the muscarinic stimulants that is that this muscarinic agonist like acetylcholine there will be an increase in potassium current in arterial muscle cells and in the cells of the SA and AV nodes as well so potassium current IK acetylcholine in arterial muscle cells comes increase potassium and a decrease in the slow inward calcium current in heart cells so this is in a molecular level and a reduction in the hyperpolarization activated current that underlies the diastolic depolarization you have already read about the phase 1 to phase 4 of the how the cardiac action potential generates in the physiology yes so basically these are the different steps and how it increase or decrease for example it decrease the calcium influx it increase the potassium influx and ultimately it causes reduction in the hyperpolarization activated current and all it, all of these actions are mediated by the m2 receptors present in the heart and contributes the slowing of the pacemaker rate pacemaker rate that is the heart pacemaker that is the sa node SA node causes less impulse generation, less contraction. This is known as the chronotropic effect, lesser chronotropic effect, lesser heart rate. Okay. So ultimately that can lead to bradycardia. So FX1 and 2 causes hyperpolarization and decrease the contractility of the arterial cells. So arterial cells contractility is decreased. In the GI tract, all muscarinic agonists increase the tone and motility and large doses will cause spasm and tenesmus. Tone and motility is increased, secretion is increased and if we can give the large dose, ultimately spasm, abdominal pain can occur. Urinary tract, the choline esters and pilocarpine, they contract the detrusor muscles of the bladder. Already we have seen that there is within the bladder, in the anatomy we have seen that there are detrusor muscles and they basically contract this. So when the contraction of the detrusor muscle occurs, there will be increased voiding pressure and ultimately the bladder capacity will be decreased. So there will be less bladder volume and increased ureteral peristalsis. In addition, the trigon and external sphincter muscle relax and ultimately voiding occurs. Okay. So ultimately in the urinary this is the actions of the muscarinic agonist. In the exocrine glands, already we have discussed time and again that basically all these increase the secretions, all these. So stimulate secretion of the lacrimal, salivary, digestive, tracheobronchial, sweat glands. All the secretions are increased. Salivation also is increased markedly by pilocarpine. This is a drug. In the respiratory system, same thing. The tracheobronchial secretions are increased. Cardiovascular system, already we have discussed. Hypotension and bradycardia. Now, if pilocarpine, pilocarpine is a cholinomimetic drug. If injected through IV route, what will happen? So, the cardiovascular effects of the most of these cholinomimetic natural alkaloids and the synthetic alkaloids are generally similar to those of the acetylcholine. So, acetylcholine, heart rate upper key kore, very important, already amra dekhe chhi, pilocarpine are more or less similar. Pilocarpine are acta exception ache, seta hoche, if given intravenously, oral route noy, experimental exercise, normally drug is abe dea hai na, it may produce hypertension after a brief initial hypotensive response because pilocarpine is purely a muscarinic agonist it do not have any effect on the nicotinic receptors so what happens the longer lasting hypertensive effect can be traced to sympathetic ganglionic discharge caused by activation of the postganglionic cell membrane m1 receptor so postganglionic cell membrane m1 receptor which close potassium channels and elicit slow excitatory postsynaptic potentials so pilocarpine is a drug that mainly acts on the muscarinic receptors like M1 receptors which is present in the membranes postganglionic ganglionic discharge is increased which close the potassium channels and elicit the depolarizing postsynaptic potential that's why if we are giving the pilocarpine by intravenous route it ultimately produces the hypertension after a brief initial hypotensive response M1 M1 is a muscarinic receptor. 
this is present ha e hocche m1 receptor arekta thake ei membrane thake post ganglionic cell membrane o thake post ganglionic cell membrane e m1 receptor thake sei ta ke activate kore mane pilocarpin okra ke activate korche heart to separate heart to m2 receptor seta separate eta mainly hocche hypertension kore karon m2 m1 receptor jeta পোস্ট গ্যাংলিয়নিক মেমব্রেনে থাকে সেটা এটা সিলেকটিভলি মানে কিছু ড্রাগ এরপর যখনই বিভিন্ন ড্রাগ দেবে কিছু ড্রাগ কিছু রিসেপ্টরকে মোর এফেক্ট করে কিছুটা কম এফেক্ট করে পাইলোকার্পিনের কেমিক্যাল কম্পাউন্ড এমনই যেটা এই এম ওয়ান রিসেপ্টরটাকে মেনলি অ্যাক্টিভেট করছে দ্যাটস ওয়াই এরকম হচ্ছে জিআইটির ক্ষেত্রে অলরেডি ডিসকাস দিস ইজ মোর অর লেস সিমিলার এম থ্রি রিসেপ্টর ইজ রিকোয়ার্ড ফর ডাইরেক্ট অ্যাক্টিভেশন অফ দ্য স্মুথ মাসল কন্ট্রাকশন ওয়াইল এম টু রিসেপ্টর রিডিউসে সিএমপি ফরমেশন রিল্যাক্সেশন কজ বাই সিম্পাটোমিমেটিক ড্রাগস দ্য সেম থ্রি এম থ্রি রিসেপ্টর mainly is the present in the GIT. Now coming to the therapeutic uses. So acetylcholine is available as an ophthalmic surgical aid for the rapid production of the meiosis, but in most of the cases, newer drugs are available. That's why pilocarpine is very less used nowadays. Pilocarpine is available as 5 or 7.5 milligram oral doses for treatment of gerostomia. Gerostomia means there is dryness in the mouth. So it can happen in different types of the conditions, different types of the endocrine problems. where pilocarpine hydrochloride can be given but it is very rarely used or as an ophthalmic solution metacholine is basically administered for the diagnosis of the bronchial hyperreactivity it is also very lesser used so diagnosis whether the bronchial hyperreactivity is present is not for this this is known as the metacholine challenge test so metacholine is given to see whether the hyperreactivity is present is not now this sevimelin is used sevimelin is a newer muscarinic agonist with activity at m3 muscarinic receptors available orally for use in treatment of the gerostomia so sevimelin is a selective m3 receptor agonist which is orally used for the treatment of the gerostomia and agonist for the m1 and m2 receptors have been targets for drug development for cognitive impairment associated with alzheimer's disease this is under the trial now why acetylcholine is not so much used clinically because it is rapidly metabolized by the acetylcholine esterase the half life is very short its actions are of very short duration poor penetration through cornea rapidly broken down by the acetylcholine esterase before it reaches its site of action that's why acetylcholine is a prototype drug but it is not used clinically now coming to the pilocarpine already we have discussed pilocarpine is the next drug that is used it is obtained from the leaves of the pilocarpus microphyllus and different types of the other species so this is a plant from this the pilocarpine is a alkaloid it is obtained it has prominent muscarinic actions and also stimulates ganglia mainly to ganglionic muscarinic receptors that is it has no actions on the nicotinic receptors in the ganglion there are some muscarinic receptors also for example already we have seen the m1 receptor is present here it it has prominent action on these types of the muscarinic receptors it causes marked sweating salivation increase in other secretion cardiovascular effects are complex already we have discussed because it activates the muscarinic receptor that is present in the postganglionic membrane that that's why it causes the hypertension after a brief hypotension if it is applied to eye it can penetrates to cornea and promptly causes meiosis meiosis means the eyeball is becomes decreased so ciliary muscle contraction occurs and there will be fall in intraocular tension lasting for 4 to 8 hours so when there is glaucoma in the glaucoma the intraocular tension in rises because there are different types of the canals like canal of sclem from which the aqueous humor can be flowed out from the we uh, flowed out from the aqueous humor to vitreous humor now if we can decrease the uh, pupil size the canal of sclem will be open and the intraocular pressure can be decreased so in glaucoma when the intraocular pressure is high we can use the pilocarpine so that the canal of sclem will be open the ciliary muscle contraction occurs meiosis occurs and the intraocular tension decreases and it continues for 4 to 8 hours it is only used in the is 0.5 to 4% drop but it is used as a third line drug in open angle glaucoma because the stinging sensation in the eye can occur khub jala kore stinging sensation and painful spasm of accommodation and occurs accommodation the reflex thake is a accommodation reflex ta compromised hoy that's why eta khub lastly use hoy jodi onno drug e na kaj hoy 
Other uses as a meiotic are to counteract mitriatics after they have been used for testing refraction. Refraction testing a mitriatic they are normally on no use bibino type anticholinergic drug now use kora hai. Kinto kichu kichu kete jodi dorka pala pilocarpin use kora jete pare. Arakta chye iride or cyclitis a khetre to prevent or break adhesions of iris with lenser cornea by alternating it with mitriatics. Mane iride or cyclitis a chye inflammation of the iris. In such cases, meiotic or mitriatic, meaning pilocarpin or anticholinergic drug, alternatively they are high, that is adhesant to the Though it can be used as a silogog, no oral preparation is available. Already we have seen that it can be used as a gerostomia, but oral preparation is not available. Now coming to the bethanical. Bethanical can be useful in certain cases of the postoperative abdominal distension and in gastric atony or gastroparesis. So bethanical is a drug. It is also a cholinomimetic drug. It acts in the postoperative abdominal distension, gastric atony, gastroparesis. It causes symptomatic relief in congenital megacolon and gastroesophageal reflux, but is rarely used for now. But mostly it is now used in urinary retention because already we have seen it has very good actions on the MT receptor present in the urinary bladder and the sphincter muscles. So basically, when there is urinary retention, so voiding is hampered. We can use inadequate emptying of the bladder when occurs, when organic obstruction is absent. That is, there is no stone or any other organic obstruction is present. It occurs due to the spasm of the muscles in the urinary bladder. In those cases, we can use the bethanical for treatment of the urinary retention or incomplete voiding of urine. As in, it mainly occurs in some cases of the post-operative cases. Operation and pore tic tac voiding of chana urinary retention of bethanical dita parbo. Postpartum urinary retention, very common, when delivery is done, the baby is done with postpartum urinary retention. Hai. In such cases, we can give the bethanical. And in, such case, in certain cases of chronic, hypotonic, myogenic or neurogenic bladder. So basically, neurogenic bladder is a, uh, is a symptom that occurs due to some trauma or massive road traffic accident. When the spinal cord is done, it is supply. When the is In such cases, we can use the bethanical. Side effects are prominent like belching, colicky abdominal pain, involuntary urination, defecation, flushing, sweating, falling blood pressure, bronchospasm, all can occur due to the bethanical. Now coming to the botulinum toxin, there are two types of the botulinum toxin, A and B. These are highly potent exotoxins produced by the Clostridium botulinum. And this Clostridium botulinum is the responsible for the botulism, which is a type of food poisoning. These are neurotoxic proteins. They cause a long-lasting loss of cholinergic transmission by interacting with an axonal proteins involved in exocytotic release of acetylcholine. Already we have discussed that is the exocytosis of the acetylcholine within the synaptic clefts is basically blocked by this botulinum toxin. Now there are some clinical use of it also. Localized injection of minute quantity of the botulinum toxin A. This is known as the Botox or hemagglutinin complex of this botulinum toxin, it is available as disport, can be used in the treatment of a number of spastic and other neurological conditions due to overactivity of the cholinergic nerves. So when there is some overactivity of the cholinergic nerves, different types of the neurological conditions, for example, blepharospasm, spastic cerebral palsy, strabismus or squint, Spasmodic torticolis, torticolis, meaning it's a wry neck, nystagmus, meaning eyeball continuous, horizontal or vertically uh, open niche kocche, hemifacial spasm, meaning face air acidic spasm hocche, post-stroke spasticity, spasticity meaning spasm hocche, muscle ta thikta kaj kocche na, spasmodic dysphonia, axillary hyperhidrosis, hyperhidrosis meaning khub basic sweating hocche, thikha chhe, egulo different types of the neurological problem in those cases, we can decrease the cholinergic transmission by using the Botox, that is the botulinum toxin. It is increasingly being employed as beauty treatment by removal of age-related facial wrinkles, you all know. However, its incorrect injection or overdose can be dangerous. Tosis, diplopia, facial sweating, dry mouth, dysphagia, dysarthria, muscular weakness, and even respiratory paralysis, that is the death can occur. So its use should be judicious, its use should be rational. Now lastly coming to the mushroom poisoning. So mushroom, basically the muscarine, 
from which the muscarinic receptor comes, this muscarin can be obtained from mushroom also. So different mushroom contains different alkaloids that can increase the cholinergic transmissions or decrease and ultimately poisoning can happen. So the most dangerous species of the mushrooms are the Amanita phalloides. Remember Amanita phalloides is the most dangerous. Apart from this there is Amanita varna, virosa, Geromitra esculenta and Galerina. Okay. All of which contain amatoxin. Amatoxin is a potent cytotoxin that mainly acts on the cholinergic nerves. Ingestion of even a portion of one mushroom of a dangerous species may be sufficient to cause death, like this Amanita phalloides. The principal toxins, amatoxin, there is alpha and beta amanitin is a present, which basically inhibit the RNA polymerase 2 and hence block the mRNA synthesis. This causes cell death manifested particularly in the gastrointestinal mucosa, liver and kidneys. Now there are different types of the mushroom poisoning. The first one is the amatoxin type cyclopeptide poisoning. This is done by the Amanita phalloides. This is the most dangerous, most common. The symptoms such as after a latent interval of 8 to 12 hours, severe abdominal cramps and vomiting begin. So there will be a gap of 8 to 12 hours after ingestion of the Amanita phalloides. Severe abdominal cramp and vomiting occurs. That progress to profuse diarrhea. After one to two days, there will be hepatic necrosis. That is the cell death of the hepatic cells occurs. Hepatic encephalopathy, frequently renal failure occurs. And you can see the fatality rate is very high. That is the 20%. So 20% dies. Cooking the mushroom does not prevent poisoning. This is important. So if we can cook this mushroom, the Amanita phalloides, the toxins will not be destroyed by increased temperature. So a variety of antidote is used for the treatment like thioptic acid, penicillin and corticosteroid. These are basically used for the treatment of the poisoning by the Amanita phalloides. Aggressive fluid replacement is done, intensive supportive care, care is given, silimidin is given, silimidin is basically hepatoprotective agent. It is commonly used in Europe. Okay. So uh, antidotes mainly thioptic acid, penicillin, corticosteroids and silimidin is given. But in spite of giving this treatment, 20% of the patients die. So this is the first type. The second type is the muscarinic type. So muscarinic type is done, uh, this poisoning is done by the uh, species of the Enocybe and Clitocybe. Enocybe and Clitocybe species. The symptoms are the vomiting, diarrhea, bradycardia, hypotension. Salivation, meiosis, bronchospasm and lacrimation occur shortly after ingestion. Cardiac arrhythmia also can occur but the fatalities are rare. That is, this is less serious. For mushroom poisoning, predominantly muscarinic cholinergic symptoms. That is, these are the, you can see these are the, all the cholinergic symptoms. That is the muscarinic type. So there is bradycardia, there is hypotension, there is vomiting, diarrhea, increased secretion. That is, increased salivation, meiosis of the eye. That is, this is the predominantly cholinergic, that is increased cholinergic activity occurs due to enocybe and clitocybe action. That's why the treatment is the anticholinergic drug. The most common anticholinergic drug is the atropine. So atropine is given for the treatment of the muscarinic type poison. Next is the anticholinergic type. Here it is done by the Amanita muscaria and Amanita pantheria. This type causes a variety of symptoms and that may be atropine like. That is, this is the opposite of the muscarinic type. That is the anticholinergic type of poisoning. So here the excitement, delirium, flushed skin, dilated pupils, muscular jerking, tremor, etc. can occur. Here also the fatality is rare. Here we can use the anticholinesterase agent. You will read in the next class, anticholinesterase agent like physostigmine. Physostigmine is given for the treatment. Alternatively, benzodiazepine like lorazepam can be given. Benzodiazepine is a CNS drug which comes under the group of the sedative hypnotic. So lorazepam can be given or anticholinesterase drug like physostigmine can be given for the anticholinergic type of mushroom poisoning which is done by the Amanita muscaria species most commonly. And there are two other types like gastrointestinal irritant type and hallucinogenic type. It is done by the boleta species and it is done by the psilocybe species. Here again the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea can occur. The treatment is done by the antiemetic and intravenous and oral fluids. And here again the mitriasis, intense visual hallucination can occur. Here we again we have to give the sedative hypnotic drug like the diazepam or lorazepam, haloperidol etc. can be given. 
Now, why atropine should not be prescribed in anticholinergic type of mushroom poisoning? So, atropine is a drug that acts just opposite of the acetylcholine. So, intoxication produced by the Amanita muscaria and Amanita species arises from the neurologic and hallucinogenic properties of the mucimol, ebotenic acid and other isoxazole derivative. So, these are the alkaloids that is present within the mushroom. These agents basically stimulate the excitatory and inhibitory amino acid receptors. So, symptoms range from irritability, restlessness, ataxia, the hallucinogen, different types of the hallucinations occur. So, treatment is mainly supportive. That's why there will be no use of using the atropine type of the drugs. We have to give different types of the CNS drugs, like that of the benzodiazepines and indicated, like diazepam, lorazepam, etc when excitation predominates, whereas atropine often exacerbates the delirium. So this is all about the cholinergic system. In the next class, you will read about the anticholine esterases and uh, organophosphorus poisoning. Now, any question?